And today, I want to go on a pathway that actually helps us celebrate our house churches. We've done this once last year, and we want to do this once a year, just to, to, to take time to, to celebrate our house church, to come together, uh, to pray for our house church leaders. All right, because what's the Bible say? Pray for your leaders, all right? And, and this, is a, this is a major ministry. This is a 30-year-old ministry in this church that has had strength, gone from strength to strength to strength. It's been a, um, it was proudly, even in my own job description, the front page, the preamble of this church is, we do most of our pastoral care through our house church structure. And I'm like, whoa, that's big, because otherwise this is a big church to try for me to catch up on. But we have a strong culture that this is something, this is a group deal of our church that is worth celebrating. And, and the participation rate of our adults sitting always between the 65 to 70 percent, the, no, the goal is 75 percent, that's higher than many Baptist churches in this country. All right, higher than most churches in this country. It's a really good accomplishment. We want to keep that up because we see strength in that. We see the strength of community. We see the strength of discipleship. We see the strength of people using their gifts and exhorting each other and all those things. So we want to take this time now to celebrate those things. And um, I just want to... Uh, today I anticipate preaching to the choir a bit. I actually... Um, some of us may need to be reminded of this, or maybe we need to uh, you know, reconsider where we stand with a few things. Life changes all the time. But I just want to talk a, a remind us that we as a church need to be on a journey towards maturity, always, and we never arrive. All right? That's why we do marriage weekends, because we never arrive in marriage. It's why we do things, why we constantly talk about the simple things in, in church as well as the big things. Because we never arrive. We talk about maturity as an ongoing practice. And also we, we really believe in the value of community. We are not islands who just blow in on a Sunday morning and disappear through the week. All right? In the big cities, you know, like in Sydney, we had a church that did just that. You know, we've, I've seen churches that have been like that. People who have really super busy lives and heavily shuttered homes. And they go to their high security homes on the week and they'll do their work online and their kids will hide and play video games rather than be in the sunlight and get some good fresh air and be amongst youth groups and stuff. They will, there will be this shuttered life and compartmentalized life and then they'll blow in on a Sunday, do their 90 minutes and go again. And that is such an anemic way to do community. But we have something special in our midst that we can celebrate and remind. And for those not in it yet, this will be a challenge for you to go, you know what, come on in, the water's fine. Let's remind ourselves of a few comments about the, what the Bible tells us about maturity. Where the, the journey that often talks about maturity in the New Testament is simply the one of going from milky things to meaty things. All right, you know, the, our federal government doesn't like meat at the moment, but we live in a meat territory. All right, so we, we need to celebrate that fact. <laughs> but um, it, you know, this is some of the stuff that Paul writes to a, a very, a church that thinks they've arrived, but they really haven't in the city of Corinth. And he writes these things, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? I love the word mere in there, because it actually um, taps into that idea we talked about in, in, in Revelation, that humanity will be restored fully to the complete vocation that we are designed to do, to be the image bearers of God. But this mere humans idea indicates that this church has been set apart to be part of that royal priesthood, that people who would be fulfill their vocation as image bearers and ambassadors of Christ, they're actually falling short of that. It goes on to say this in chapter 14. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. If you know your context, that actually has a lot to do with the use of charismatic gifts in the church in their midst and what is going on there and, and how people are pulling rank and going a little bit silly 
with those gifts in their midst. Hebrews chapter 5 is another verse we love to talk about. I use this copiously and I make no apologies. We have much to say about this. This is the, the writer of Hebrews, possibly Apollos, actually saying, there's stuff that you could really engage with powerfully here, but hang on, I've got a backtrack here. It's hard to make it clear for you because you no longer try to understand. That's a rival. That's dangerous. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish, to discern, to know good from evil. That writer goes on in chapter 10 to say, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Deeply consider is what that word means. How do we, how do, how do we consider to discern together how we can spur each other on in love and good deeds? You can't do that from a YouTube channel. You have to rub shoulders with others to be able to do that. Love and good deeds. Who is motivating you to love and good deeds? Oh, I'm self-generated. That won't last. We need people to help us sharpen us, to challenge us, to help us deeply consider, to discern together. Okay, discernment by yourself is not biblical. Discernment together is let us discern how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. What I really notice is that there's a lot of doomsday people on YouTube going, oh yeah, the day's approaching, the rapture's happening, yeah, blah, 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 and all these conspiratorial things are happening, therefore get your life right. And those same people will hide in their lounge rooms or in their basements doing YouTube channels instead of being in community. What an absolute contradiction. As you see the day approaching, don't go hiding away from people going, oh, they're not teaching the truth and I've got the good oil. But get in community and discern truth together. So here is, among other things, a bit of a picture of biblical infancy. Super spirituality, I've put it at the top. <laughs> so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. Using one-upmanship, abusing the word prophecy and calling last night's pizza or your conspiratorial dreams prophecy or listening to people who, who, flat, who do that. Considering yourself superior because you speak in tongues but your brother doesn't. All sorts of things that we can throw into that super spirituality space. Bickering and refusal to reconcile. A person, a Christian who refuses to reconcile with their brother is actually a disobedient Christian, right? All right, Jesus said, leave your gift on the altar. Don't even bother trying to worship until you've got things right with your brother. All right, otherwise your prayer won't get past the ceiling, friends. That's just the Bible. Self-elevation with an equal sign. Gee, I really typed that well, didn't I? <laughs> Fixation on personalities and charisma rather than character. All right, we can, we can um, be fixated on different preachers. That, 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 that their rhetoric s scratches our ear and makes us feel great. And there are some amazing preachers out there, but will they be present when you're in the midst of crisis and pastor you? No. Neither will they even try to do that, but for some reason as followers, we tend to flock to those things. And they're people that we know through their charisma, through what they portray rather than who they really are. And sometimes people's charisma trips them, so it kind of trips them up and their character disappears. Refusal to meet. 
If we will not meet together, there is an infancy chip going on, friends. There's something not right about that. Grown-ups meet together to discern truth together and love and good deeds together because love is the most mature version of Christianity anyway. I need others to help me learn to love. So do you. And inability or perhaps even refusal to teach. I love that Hebrews idea. By now you should be teachers. But you're not yet. Disciples will always have an L plate because that's what the word means. Methetes means learner. But we always, at some point, gain a bit of understanding of the ropes enough to train others. It should be on our heart that we can reach out and we can train somebody else in matters of faith that we are proficient in. We should be in the habit of seeking to do that without lording over people, but just going, you know what? I see where you're at. I've been there too. Can I help you? Can I give you a hand up on that? Maturity happens, surprise, surprise, together. Ephesians 4, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service. Oh, for works of service. We don't come to church to receive, we come to give. We come to church to give in worship, to give in service to each other, in service to our King. And when we get up and preach and when your house church leaders and when others who are influential in your life are inputting into you, it's to equip you to serve. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants. Tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming and their endless YouTube channels to back it up. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body. You can't be a body if you're doing it by your own, by yourself. The body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Maturity happens by qualified people and called people and equipped people to equip people, to build them up, to promote unity, to bring a body together so it functions as a body, not as floating body parts. I'll come back to this other verse in a moment. I've been captured lately by the thoughts of Dietrich Bonhoeffer all over again. I'm in that place now where all my Bible study is done, all my theological study is finished. And I've done all the things I've kind of had to do to please faceless overlords in colleges who are marking my work. I'm actually just getting into the things that wasn't part of the program before and I'm loving it. I'm loving reading the work of Augustine of all things. And I'm loving you know, Bonhoeffer and I'm loving uh, some of this classic stuff. There's so many things, classic stuff that I still have to catch up on. And I'm looking forward to just doing that. I love it. Reading a lot of Tom Wright at the moment and things like that. It's really good stuff. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that the person who loves their dream of community 
the way you want it to be, will actually destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. The one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. And God has put this word into the mouths of others in order that it can be communicated to us. He's writing this to seminary students. When one person is struck by the word, he speaks it to others. God has willed that we should seek and find his living word in the witness of a brother, in the mouth of a man. Therefore, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged, for by himself, he cannot help himself without belying the truth. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. I'm captured all over again by that. Friends, what we have in our house churches at the moment is strength and community. House church leaders who deeply care for the welfare of the people that are in there, that meet within their midst. People who deeply care about the growth and the maturity that the people under their care attain. Present in the pastoral needs and the day-to-day pastoral things and sometimes the crises that happen. There is community and, and togetherness and strength that I see in a number of our house church uh, groups that just is, it just adds a dimension to their faith. And I can see if you are better in your group than you are if you weren't in one. I can honestly say that. And the leaders, I want to commend the leaders, and we are going to pray for our leaders in just a few minutes. And we want to, I want to commend these people to you. But I also I want to challenge two groups of people today. First, those who are not in that yet. I really want to ask you, why is that? If it's a time factor, I don't see any way to get around that. The Bible calls us to make time for meeting, for community, for drawing strength on the brother. The Bible calls for that. Why? You know, some of it is, is unreconciled relationships. That is pure disobedience. And the scriptures call us to actually get those things right. To avoid community is to get in the habit of doing that. And, and you can't discern truth. It will get veiled more and more the more you do it alone. I need the gospel in my brother. I need the gospel in my sister. And I am not alone here today. You need the gospel in your brother and your sister. And I want to implore us. I, I, there, is, there should be a case of 100% of all our adults seeking community in this manner. What is stopping us from going down that path? The other group of people I want to... So if you're new and you're going, oh, gee, how do I get into this? I am the conduit for that at the moment. So I want you to come and find me after the service. Give me your name, your number, and the best days that you know that in your week, how they sort of look. And it's my job to try to connect you in and make that, that fit for you. I would, love, I would love the problem. I would love the logistical issue of trying to fit everybody into a house church. And I know there's a number of, community, of creative solutions we can find to get that started. The other thing is this. I'm captured by what Hebrews says. By now you should be teachers. And for eight years I've been talking about this. There are people in every group right now who could step out and be a teacher. There are people right now in every single group who could step out and just 
Do a little bit of pastoral care for half a dozen people and go, hey, how you doing? Doing a text out, checking in on people's welfare and, and just, you know, here's the deal. If you find yourself out of your depth, that's where it comes back to me. We usually, the Moses and Jethro idea in our church that, you know, Jethro's, Jethro's advice to Moses was to appoint captains so he didn't burn himself out taking all the care cases across all of Israel. And then Moses heeds that advice and goes, all right, let's go appoint captains. And these captains receive the judgments, uh, the, the journey, the, the, the stuff that the people of the church, of the city, of the nation were going through. And the instructions were, captain, if you can't handle it, send it to Moses. Now, I'm not exactly Moses, I know that. I didn't come down from no mountain, I didn't give the war. But I am someone who is present that when you go, that's out of my depth, what do I do next? Theologically, pastorally, clinically, professionally, something here needs extra input. Cam, where do I do, what do I do next with this? That's where it comes back to me. And that is a model we've been working with in pastoral care. Some might say, well, I'm not pastorally present. That's true, I'm not, but I am if I have to be. And I am for the crisis bits. And I am for the hard things. I am. And, but your house church leaders are present and doing excellent work. If you get amongst that program, that system, you will be cared for really, really well. I can vouch for them all. So will you get connected? And will you perhaps even step out and become the next round of teachers that we need? I'm absolutely wrapped. If demand outweighs supply, but at the same time, we'll burn out fast if supply can't be met and it's left on a couple of people to make that work. I know some people are ready to step out. Make yourself known. Let's do that. My last point before we get over to the worship team and hand over our... I've been thinking about a Bible verse here that actually come to mind as I was thinking about all this. I'll come back to it. 1 John chapter 2. Look at this. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And because it's poetic, he did it again. I'm writing, you, I'm writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I see three groups, three age groups kind of being referred to there. And I know I'm not alone in seeing that as, as I've read some of the, the, the ideas out there. And Children. Children simply know forgiveness. They know the name of the one who has done so. Children are the one who go, I'm, I'm, I'm right with God and somehow I'm not going to hell no more. But then I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. All of a sudden, we have an expansion of theology, an expansion of God's story. The fathers, by implication here, are the ones with longevity. You have yards, you have scars, you have victories, you have failures to learn from, you've, you've done the hard yards and you have an understanding of God that is different to the one that just knows forgiveness. You know the faithfulness from start to where you're at. You know him who was from the beginning. You know the faithfulness of God. You've got a story of God's faithfulness to tell. And I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. In this generation, the generation that is going to cop the heaviest, hardest hits are the ones that actually are the, the, the ones, that the, the, the young ones, the ones who are a little bit out of infancy. I've got a few understandings under my belt. I feel a little bit bulletproof. 
but I haven't got to the point where I've learned all the lessons I need to learn yet, i.e. about 40. You know, that, you know how in, in, in life we get that age group of about 15 to 40 that we kind of think we know everything and then we get to a point where we know we don't? And John writes to them and says, you guys are overcoming. The devil is hitting you hard. And you guys are overcoming. You are staying ahead. You are keeping diligent. There's three different age groups there. And I just wanted to, I've just been thinking about stages of life. The obvious one is infancy. Babies, and we see that in life. We know how dependent babies are. We know what they don't know. We know how much care they do. We know how much stink they make and how much mess they make and how much we're always trying to repeat ourselves over and over and over again. All those different things. But it's such a beautiful stage of life too. But then, over time, they start to learn to eat better and start to clean up after themselves, sort of, and then they become adolescents and it all goes backwards, right? But uh, we got adolescents next. Adolescence kind of pushes the buttons a bit. And they're, you know, spiritual adolescence is a little bit... Uh, and there's a season to navigate through that. It's in the space of adolescence. And going into my 17, 18 year old years personally, that I had to start learning to ask for help from the overcomers above me. I remember getting my first car. Big old Valiant station wagon. And I remember, for some reason, gee, the metal on metal feeling isn't very good. I should fix these brakes. And I remember taking the car apart and I realized the disc had to come off. And I'm like, and I'm staring. I seriously, my dad's going, my stepdad, he goes, I'll come and give you a hand. I'm like, no, nah, I'll do this myself because I was a smarmy adolescent. Do this myself. And I stared at that thing for ages. He's never worked on a Valiant. What would he know? He's got Fords. He's a Ford man. <laughs> and he's just gone. And then he just sort of leans over my shoulder. Go away. Leans over. I'm here. Go away. I'm staring at that. And eventually he just goes, son, you need a 14 mil spanner. He was right. Sometimes we get that adolescence space where we kind of get a bit bulletproof and we know everything. We need the voice of the overcomers. That early adulthood, we think we're bulletproof and we load up on junk food and all the different things, but we realize at a point, gee, that'll catch up. Then we get to older adulthood and suddenly life changes, don't we? All of a sudden you might become an, a... a, a Hey, empty nester. Gee, the people in my immediate care have changed, but all of a sudden I've got to care for others. How? The 40-year-old bracket in the church are the generation known right now as the deconstructors, the people who are going, what really matters? And how does the church interact with the faith I'm having now and the world that's changing and all these things? This woke agenda out there seems to make so much sense and the church can't handle it, the church can't speak to it. <sighs> Ah, I'm, I'm out there, I'm done. Someone needs to be present to help them reconstruct, to interact with their doubts, to interact with the questions that haven't been traditionally answered in the church in a changing world. Some might identify as, I'm close to that point now, I've got questions and no one's engaging with it, help me. They need a teacher, they need a gospel and an overcomer. There's grandparents. Grandparents, we make a bit of a joke about the boomer generation at the moment about there's those who kind of really get close and amongst their families and are present and that sort of stuff. And then you've got another group who are kind of like off spending the kids' inheritance. And sometimes that can be true in church too. There are some churches out there that will defend certain traditions and things like that so much that they will spend their kids' inheritance, and at least spiritually speaking. But what the church actually needs from you, grandparents, are the stories of God's faithfulness over the long haul. 
The gospel in you is your 70-year faith journey, your 80-year faith journey. You're not done telling God's story. And community needs that. Together, the community flourishes because all of those stories can be told. You might identify a different stage that you're in and there are pros and cons to the stage you are in. Some of it, you need help and other things, you've got stories to tell. And you need an outlet to tell them that isn't always up here unless you do GuideX next year. But it can be in the house church structure that we have in our church now. So I want to challenge you on these things. What stage in spiritual life best describes you? And how deep in community are you? What is the Lord doing in our midst to change that, to challenge that?